My guest is Heather McDonald. Heather McDonald is a fellow with the Manhattan Institute. She's a graduate of Yale undergraduate. She has a master's from Cambridge. She also has a law degree from Stanford. You know, Heather, you wrote a book, among many, called The War on Cops. What is the basis for this narrative that the cops are systemically racist against black people, that they're more inclined to use deadly force against black people just because they're black? Last year, the number of unarmed, so-called unarmed blacks who were, who were fatally shot by the cops, the number is four, four. Last year, there was over 10,000 blacks who were killed in, by homicide. Why don't we talk about that and why do we focus on the rare cop shootings, most of which are justified because they're, the cops are facing armed and resisting suspects because the country does not want to talk about black crime and they would rather talk about phony cop racism than look at the reason why cops are disproportionately deployed in minority neighborhoods, which is the fact that blacks are dying. Heather, it is so nice to talk to you. I've always been amazed at how intrepid you are. I think you were trying to give a speech was it at Berkeley uh, and you got hounded and were unable to give the speech or at least unable to allow students to hear the speech in class. Uh, is that what happened? Well, that was in your backyard, Larry. It was Claremont uh, College, Claremont McKenna. Uh, yeah, this was pre-George Floyd, but post-Ferguson effect. And yeah, the, the students circled the uh, auditorium where I was supposed to be speaking so nobody could get in. So I spoke to an empty hall until the police decided it was too dangerous because people were pounding on the glass windows outside trying to get in. So I was shuffled through the kitchen and, and, and taken off campus by the police. And, and Claremont is not a particularly left-wing campus. It's, it's known for being relatively conservative. Well, it used to be. You know, no, nothing we thought we knew about colleges <laughs> really holds true today. But, but I suppose it's not quite as left-wing as the other Claremont colleges around it, like Pomona and uh, Scripps and whatnot. So the students came from those colleges as well. But basically, there's nothing left of uh, traditional colleges that are not explicitly conservative. The, the academic rot and the, the cowardice on the part of, of uh, administrators, if not active complicity in the identity politics ideology is pretty ubiquitous. You know, Heather, you wrote a book among many called The War on Cops. Why did you get involved in this whole area of, of study in the first place? It began, Larry, uh, in the aftermath of a very terrible shooting in New York City in 1999 by the police of a West Ghanaian immigrant named Amadou Diallo. This was the infamous 41 shots. It was a, a unit that was supposed to be taking illegal guns off the street to protect black lives. And they saw a man in a neighborhood that had had a series of rapes. Uh, he was fumbling with his keys outside of an apartment and the the cops, these four cops, thought that he resembled the description. Uh, the, he didn't understand English. He didn't put his hands up when they asked him, reached for his cell phone and they shot him. And this, this provoked a frankly opportunistic uh, paroxysm of protest in New York City. You had Al Sharpton and, and a whole bunch of celebrities, Susan Sarandon getting themselves arrested uh, outside the New York Police Department headquarters. And it was opportunistic because the traditional elites that hated, uh, that controlled New York up until Mayor Rudolph Giuliani was elected in 1994, they hated the fact that he had actually brought crime down, something that they said couldn't be done unless you solved the crime's alleged root causes of poverty and racism. Those are not the root causes of inner city crime. The root causes you have spoken of so eloquently, Larry, is, inner, is family breakdown. Uh, but Giuli Giuliani and his, his police commissioner, William Bratton, actually succeeded in bringing safety to inner city neighborhoods. So the Diallo shooting was seized upon opportunistically to claim that the NYPD was out of control, that it was, it was uh, routinely gunning down black males. And if the New York Times was running three articles a day about the racist NYPD, that gets my attention. You know, I figure if, if, <laughs> if the consensus at the, at the New York Times is 
is X, I'm going to try to believe, I'm going to look to see whether Y is in fact the case. So I went out and I went to these neighborhoods. I went to the Soundview section of the Bronx where, where Diallo had been tragically shot. I went to central Brooklyn. I went to East Harlem. I talked to people on the streets. And what I heard from those people was, we want more cops. We don't want less cops. We want more cops. We want more enforcement. There's too many gangbangers running around. And that began for me a decades long attempt to tell the story and give voice to residents of high crime neighborhoods as they beg for more cops, as they beg for law enforcement. And frankly, it also was a moral crusade because the cops were the one profession where you are deemed racist from the day you step on the job. And so I, that was the time of the driving while black conceit and racial profiling and whatnot. And I just kept going with it. And sadly, uh, public narrative and mainstream narrative didn't get any saner. Uh, over time, it got worse and worse. And uh, the thousands of black lives that have been taken since 1999 because of this phony narrative about cops being racist for going where crime is happening and trying to protect victims, the thousands of lives that have, have been lost by, by that narrative uh, never gets noticed by the mainstream media. They only care, as you have, again have pointed out, uh, in those rare instances where a white cop shoots a, uh, a black person ostensibly unarmed. Uh, so it, it, it be, just became a growing interest of mine. Heather, I remember that case. I also remember, I think Hillary was in the Senate at the time. Uh, I could be wrong about that. But I know that she publicly referred to the four cops who were involved as murderers. Those cops were tried. As I recall, they were all found not guilty by a multi-ethnic jury. Yeah, well, we'll hope that that lasts. You know, uh, one of the things that I fear, Larry, is that the great crown jewel of Western civilization, which is the confidence that if you come under state power, you have a neutral tribunal that you can present facts to and you can get a fair hearing from either a judge or a jury. Uh, I'm, I'm right now listening to a historical novel about the communist takeover in Hungary and the rebellion against it. There is nothing more terrifying than, than coming under state power where you have no recourse to justice. And these days, you know, the riot ideology is such that it's not clear, you know, whether juries believe that they can deliberate uh, without the Damocles sword hanging over their deliberations, that if they don't convict a cop in a racially charged, and the, the, the racial charge inevitably comes not from the inherent facts, but from the media, but if they follow the facts where they lead them and it does not result in a conviction of that cop, they may face the burning of American cities on their, you know, as, as response as their responsibility. So mm -hmm. this is a very worrisome development. I want to get into some of the data, but first I want to tell you a story, Heather. I don't think I've ever told you this. Uh, I was invited to speak before the Ohio State football team by the then coach Urban Meyer. I went to Michigan. Uh, there's a blood sport between Michigan and Ohio State. And so I was shocked to get the invitation. Uh, coach Meyer <laughs> uh, uh, directs messages me on, on, on Twitter and asked me to call him. So I called him. I didn't, never spoke to him before. And he said, your show airs in Columbus where I am. And last month I had a Black Lives Matter type come in to talk to my football players, got them all angry about cops, got them all thinking about cops as being systemically racist. I know you have a different point of view, would you fly to Columbus and speak with my team? And I agreed to do wow. so. I, I waived my normal fee because I wanted to talk to these kids. And relying a lot on your scholarship and relying a lot on the scholarship of people like Roland Fryer, I said, if anything, the cops are more hesitant, more reluctant to pull the trigger on a black suspect than on a white suspect. I said, uh, in recent years, cops have killed more unarmed whites than unarmed blacks. And I said, name one unarmed white. And I dropped right. the mic and I crossed my arms like this and I waited a full 20 or 30 seconds, which sounds like an eternity in a speech, for one of these kids, and roughly there were 100 people there, maybe 70% of them were black. I waited for one of them to say one name. Nobody could come up with a single name. What is the basis for this narrative that the cops 
are systemically racist against black people, that they're more inclined to use deadly force against black people just because they're black. Well, first of all, let me throw out a name, and, and the next time you do this wonderful humanitarian gesture, uh, Larry, and you know, it's, it's not fun going into the lion's den, ask them if they know who Tony Timpa was. Right. Because Tony Timpa was an absolute precursor of George Floyd. This was a white man in Dallas uh, in 2016 who had called the cops saying he was off his psychiatric medication and was scared. Uh, when the cops arrived, the, the local store had already put him in handcuffs. The cops kept him on the ground, face down, handcuffed for 13 minutes while joking about his mental condition, during which time he about 30 times said, I can't breathe, you know, I'm dying. And they didn't let him up. And when they loaded him onto the ambulance that finally arrived, one of them said, I hope we didn't kill him. Well, they had, uh, and nobody knows his name because he was white. Uh, so, you know, these things happen. And as you say, twice as many whites get killed by the cops. Last year, the number of unarmed, so-called unarmed blacks who were, who were fatally shot by the cop by the cops, my guess is even your listeners, Larry, would put the number in the dozens, if not the hundreds, and, and probably NPR would put it in the thousands. The number is four, four. Last year, there was over 10,000 blacks who were killed in, by homicide, uh, and, and the children that were killed by drive-by shootings, the black children, one-month-olds, one-year-olds, three-year-olds, six-year-olds, nine-year-olds, girls, boys playing in their in their front yard, in their backyard, sleeping in their beds, p jumping on a trampoline, brutally gunned down by these ruthless, savage young kids who've not been civilized that just go and spray bullets wildly. Why don't we talk about that? And why do we focus on the rare cop shootings, most of which are justified because they're, the cops are facing armed and resisting suspects? because the country does not want to talk about black crime. Uh, it's very uncomfortable with that fact. And if you talk about the black victims, uh, you are going to have to talk about black criminals because black victims overwhelmingly are shot by other blacks. And I think the country is, is terrified that those behavioral gaps will not close. They've given up on the instruction in bourgeois values and whites would are simply turning their eyes away and they would rather talk about phony cop racism than look at the reason why cops are disproportionately deployed in minority neighborhoods, which is the fact that blacks are dying. You know, the, this idea that black lives matter to the media, it's such BS, it's such, it, it doesn't matter to the activists. Where have the Black Lives Matter activists in the media been when these children get gunned down? Uh, they, they don't want to talk about that. And instead, we blame the messenger, uh, which are cops responding to 911 calls, to shots fired technology. The only way to not have a disparate impact in law enforcement and that concept of disparate impact is tearing down everything in law enforcement today the only way to avoid disparate impact in law enforcement is not to enforce the law. And that's what's happening. I mean, that's, you know, you talk about George Gascon, that's what's happening. That's why every, these left-wing prosecutors are not enforcing the law because if they do so, they will have a disparate impact on blacks. But guess what has a disparate impact on blacks? Crime. Blacks die of homicide between the ages of 10 and 34 at 13 times the rate of whites. That is a civil rights problem. The cops aren't a civil rights problem. The black bodies are a civil rights problem. Uh, Heather, I know about the case of Tony Tempa out of Dallas. I was talking about uh, the fact that there are more unarmed whites killed every year than unarmed blacks. Uh, I get a phone call from Gloria on my radio show from Dallas. And she's going off, she happens to be black, going off about uh, that uh, there aren't uh, unarmed whites killed. I said, Gloria, 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 you're in Dallas. You, know, you ever heard of Tony Tempa? She said, who? And I told her <laughs> yeah. roughly the same facts that you just now gave. She's in Dallas, calling from Dallas, had never heard of Tony Tempa. Yep. The media does not care. I mean, here's the rule of thumb. Uh, if there's a clenched teeth media report of a crime and the criminal's race is not mentioned, it's because the, the criminal is black. 
the criminal's race will be mentioned only if white and a police officer uh, and a shooting will be talked about only if the police officer is white and the victim is black. If a police victim is white, we will not hear about it. And as we know with the Ashley Babbitt shooting, if it's a black cop and a white victim in what to, looks to me to be a patently unjustified shooting, that shooting will be at the, at the January 6th Capitol riot. Uh, that shooting will be go down the memory hole and the cop will be granted anonymity. Uh, there will be no investigations and, and, you know, he'll be cleared and nobody will want to talk about that. And, and Heather, you and I didn't plan this, but you hear all the police sirens behind you as, as you're speaking? Yeah. Yeah. That's that, New York. That, that's New York. That, that's not my side. That's your side. Now, you mentioned, that's my side. You, you mentioned so-called unarmed. And I think you mean that because you can be unarmed uh, and still dangerous. Michael Brown in Ferguson was unarmed, uh, yet uh, his DNA was found on the officer's gun. So unarmed does not mean not dangerous. Right. I'm putting it in scare quotes, Larry, because the, the numbers come from the Washington Post database of fatal police shootings. And they include in their unarmed category people like Michael Brown, exactly, who are grabbing an officer's gun or beating him with it or fleeing in a stolen car with a handgun on the seat next to him. Uh, so, you know, but, but even so, let's give them that, let's pretend that the four are truly unarmed and we're not posing any kind of risk, which is wrong. I mean, and, and as you also know, Larry, the, here's the way you stop cop shootings. You comply, you do not resist arrest. Right. And, and for George Gascon and, and Alvin Bragg here in New York City to say that they are not interested in prosecuting resisting arrest is probably the biggest assault that these men who are supposed to be supporting the rule of law could have on, on civilization because allowing people to attack officers to not obey their commands is a recipe for chaos. The Washington Post doesn't regard resisting arrest as something that is of any given note, but that is what is driving virtually all cop shootings. If you comply, put your hands up, you're not going to get shot. It would also help don't commit crime uh, because most of the people who are shot by the cops uh, have committed a crime. And, you know, Candace Owens got, gets the Hero Award of the Year for, for mentioning the tragic fact that civil rights martyrs these days uh, tend to be uh, petty or, or serious thugs who got themselves shot by the cops. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Roland Fryer. You, you mentioned Candace Owens. She was interviewing uh, a left-wing professor named Mark Lamont Hill, who conceded oh. that the studies show that the cops aren't using deadly force against blacks because they're blacks. He conceded this. Roland Fryer, uh, as you know, is a Harvard economist, uh, brilliant, one of the youngest tenured professors in the history of Harvard, and Harvard is the oldest college uh, in the country. And he just knew that the police were uh, killing black people just because they were black, because of all these high-profile deaths, uh, people like Michael Brown. Uh, and, and he did a study. Uh, and he was shocked at the results. He said they were the most surprising of his professional career. I understand he basically sacked his entire research team, hired a new research team, got the same conclusion that the police were, if anything, more reluctant, more hesitant to pull the trigger against a black suspect than a white suspect. He did find the police were more likely to use non-deadly force, and he said he didn't know why. I'll tell you why, because they don't want to get it to DEFCON 1, and they're trying to make sure they don't have to use deadly force. Well, and also, uh, he purported, uh, one of his data sets in the non-deadly force finding was the New York Police Department's forms for doing pedestrian stops. And as he admitted to me, he, he classified as fully compliant suspects who'd been stopped that the officers simply hadn't checked off relevant boxes for, and it's not the same thing. Uh, there is a study that was done in the early 2000s out of Southern California looking at several police departments and found that blacks were four times more likely to resist arrest than whites and that race was the biggest predictor of resisting arrest. So I'm not confident, frankly, in uh, Fryer's findings when it comes to a disparate use of non-lethal force that is not accounted for 
uh, by resisting arrest. But you may be right that given what we also know, Larry, which is who is fatally shooting cops, uh, historically about 42 percent of all cop killers that was found over a 10 year period and has been verified with with one year results as well uh, have been black males, even though black males are about 6 percent of the population. I, I crunched some numbers with regards to this last year's data, which I mentioned, you know, the four, the four unarmed blacks who were killed by the cops and comparing that to the 63 police officers nationwide who were um, uh, fatally murdered. And when you do the numbers on a per capita basis, you know, putting the 63 in the context of the nation's police force, which is about 670,000, and it's probably much less than that post George Floyd retirements. And, and then you do a per capita count of the four unarmed blacks against the 44 to 47 million self-identified blacks in the country. Uh, and, and then you estimate how many of those 63 police officers were likely killed by blacks you get a ratio that shows that a police officer is 400 times as likely uh, to be killed by a black person as an unarmed black is to be killed by a cop. And so that is a narrative that is completely the opposite of what we're hearing. But that does probably feed into cops' uh, situational awareness when they're dealing with suspects. Mm -hmm. Uh, as you know, Ferguson turned out to be a complete lie. Uh, Michael Brown did not have his hands up, did not say don't shoot. Uh, his friend completely and totally lied about all of that. I'm in California. There's a city, Heather, called Rialto, which is roughly 100,000 people, and its racial composition pretty much reflects the state of California. Roughly 40% Hispanic, roughly 30% white, roughly 6% uh, 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 black, roughly 9% or so Asian American. And for about a year or so, the police were given body cams. Initially, they didn't want to wear them, uh, but they did wear them. And it turned out after one year, there was a 90% reduction in complaints against the police and a 50% reduction in use of force by the police against suspects. Um, and it turned out the police were still using the same training they always used. The camera didn't alter their training. The suspects, the civilians, stopped lying. And, as a re and stop resisting. And as a result, the cops did not need to use the kind of force that they needed to use before they had the cameras. So it benefited both sides of the transaction. Uh, civilians stopped lying, and cops now had evidence that they were not, in fact, engaging in the kind of conduct uh, as, for example, they were alleged to have engaged in during Ferguson. Well, it's a very costly thing, but I am totally for uh, body cams. And what's costly, oddly, is not the Tech, the equipment itself, it's the storage issue. And departments are really like pulling their hair out of what to do with it because you generate so much tape. And uh, this would be one area where the federal government could possibly help with funding. Although I have basically view federal dollars as just a, a waste because it's just taking money from the same taxpayers, sending them to Washington, you know, minus all of the administrative costs, sending them back to the state. So you know, even there, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to say, well, let's have federal funding of this because it's still your same taxpayers. But anyway, that's a that's a tough issue. Police departments haven't figured out, you know, if we had a tech industry uh, that was not captured by the left, possibly they could come up with very efficient and cheap ways to store all that tape. But yes, it's a very good thing. It's also often you get now the left wing taking over civilian complaint review boards and removing the ability of of a city to uh, take action against people who are found to have been lying against the cops in in city after city now any kind of penalty is being thrown out the window and so there's no there's no incentive not to lie and you know if you do lie you get the hope of a specious undeserved payout and maybe even the press is going to take up your cause but but the more transparency, the better. Well, as you know, Heather, I ran unsuccessfully for governor of California, and one of my big issues was crime. After Gavin Newsom survived the recall, 
he signed a flurry of bills, one of which was to discourage the use of criminal enhancement charges against bad guys. Uh, many of the murders in California are committed by gang members. It turns out a large number of the gang members are black and brown. And as far as Gavin Newsom is concerned, prosecuting them uh, would be an example of systemic racism because a disproportionate number of those being prosecuted are going to be black and brown. Never mind, as you pointed out, that a disproportionate uh, number of the victims are black and brown. But because of systemic racism, uh, his argument for systemic racism anyway, uh, he is now uh, pressuring DAs not to charge bad guys to the fullest extent of their crimes. In other words, Heather, you white people need to pick it up and commit more crime so the bad uh, people of color can be prosecuted properly. Larry, I, I, I can't state enough. Everything in our world today can be explained by one thing, which is disparate impact. If you see an academic standard being torn down in California, if you see that they're not going to be teaching algebra or calculus in high school or the University of California is not going to allow students to submit SATs, if you see prosecutors saying that they're not going to prosecute theft, looting, resisting arrest, uh, here in New York, we have turnstile jumping, which only exists in very mild, few places in Los Angeles, but in San Francisco, um, or, uh, you know, other types of theft of service. It's all because of disparate impact. Because of the cultural breakdown in the inner city, which is not universal, you know, uh, you go to a police precinct house and it's extraordinarily uplifting to see the, the absence of racial identity there. And you have white cops, black cops, brown cops, all brothers in supporting the law. Nevertheless, there is an oppositional gangster hip hop culture that is very barbaric. Uh, and it, it means that any kind of meritocratic standard in academia with the academic skills gap being what it is, or behavioral standard in the criminal law with the crime gap being what it is, will have a disparate impact on blacks. And as a society, we have decided that we'd rather unwind those standards than hold everybody to the same universal expectations. And that is paternalistic, it's condescending, and it is a recipe for more dysfunction. I'm in Los Angeles. During the O.J. Simpson case, the LAPD chief was black. We had back to back black police chiefs here in Los Angeles. Uh, the police department now represents the demographic of the city. The city is roughly 40% Hispanic, as is the LAPD, roughly 30% white, as is the LAPD, roughly 9% uh, black, as is the LAPD, roughly 6% or so Hispanic, as is the LAPD. And when something goes down, Heather, you still hear the same charge of systemic racism. It doesn't seem to matter. Yeah. Well, I remember Bernie Parks, and he was a hero because he fought uh, against Han's effort to put the LAPD under a consent decree, and he knew what was coming, which was endless paperwork, minutiae, uh, you know, the most trivial requirements and in massive costs and whatnot. So he was a good chief, and he defended the cops for going where the crime is. Uh, but yeah, the, the idea that you need a... a, a, a police force that matches the demographics is very dangerous because, again, I'm sorry to keep harping on this, but given the academic skills gap and the behavior gap, in order to try and get more minorities into police departments, yes, we all need to recruit more, but believe me, there's not a police department that isn't recruiting everywhere, including in minority neighborhoods. But often what stands in the way are things like criminal background checks, uh, and, and cognitive tests. And so you have departments now that are getting rid of a requirement of, of no marijuana drug convictions on your record or lowering uh, written exam uh, cutoff scores in order to try and get minorities. Well, that too is a completely counterproductive policy because the law is very complicated and officers need to be able to understand really arcane distinctions of when they can stop. You know, you've gone to law school, but the rules for searching cars and when you can go into a container and whatnot, I mean, they're just arcane and right. broke. It's ridiculous. Uh, but also, you know, when I, was, when I was first looking at the Amadou Diallo case, 
I talked to the uh, commanding officer in the precinct where that happened, uh, Caruso, my Caruso, and he said that one difference between cops when he was growing up and today's uh, you know, younger group and frankly more diverse group is that cops in the past understood that when you join the police force, you start a new life. You break your ties with your neighborhood buddies who may be uh, involved in criminal activity. And, and cops today don't make that clean break. They, they keep their ties in the neighborhood and that can end up being compromising sometimes. And I think getting rid of requirement for a clean criminal record is also very dangerous. So I would, I would say stop diversity recruiting on police departments, stop the requirement that officers live in a jurisdiction. The only thing that should matter is do officers know how to treat people with courtesy, with professionalism and respect? Do they know the law? Do they have the emotional capacity to talk people down, to try and gain compliance without the use of force? But if, an op if a suspect resists and, and continues escalating his own resistance, the cop has no choice but to escalate his own use of force. The things that should matter are colorblind, not the color of an officer's skin. You mentioned diversity recruiting. Uh, the biggest scandal LAPD was um, Ramparts. Uh, and it inspired the movie Training Day, for which uh, Denzel Washington got an Academy Award. Many of the cops who were involved in Ramparts probably never would have been cops had they not lowered the standards uh, to achieve this kind of racial diversity we just now talked about. I can't add anything to that. That's a great, I, I would have, I forgot about that. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what we risk. You know, and Baltimore has had lots of corruption scandals, and they also have a very, uh, insistent uh, diversity ethic there in that department. Uh, I remember too, um, Charlie Beck used to be the head of the Ramparts division and him taking me around and talking about and the, the former uh, LAPD chief and just scratching his head at the insanity of the gang warfare in, in the Ramparts division, MacArthur Park. This was largely Central American gangs going at each other and just saying, you know, these are kids that are in all other aspects, almost indistinguishable. You know, they come from the same family structure, same neighborhoods, and yet they're killing each other over somebody stepping across a particular street. You know, it's just, it's utterly mind boggling. And the country, as I say, turns its eyes away from it because it's, it doesn't really know what to do. And at this point, I would say the change really does have to come from inside those communities and people starting to stigmatize fathers that go around impregnating women and not supporting them right. uh, and, and revalorizing the marriage norm. Finally, Heather, when I talk about this, I talk about the research, I talk about the evidence that shows the police are not engaging in systemic racism, uh, I get hostility and I respond, isn't this good news? Isn't this good <laughs> news that whatever it is you're bothered by turns out not to be the case? Now, you may not like the fact that the cops are disproportionately in the black community, disproportionately busting people, but isn't it good news that they're, that they're not doing it because of racism? Why aren't you happy about that? I'm bringing you good news. Instead, I'm the bad guy. Amazing. That's a, that's a very acute observation. And I can only return to the fact that we are, as a country, we are terrified about inner city dysfunction. We don't want to look at it, and it's easier to blame the messenger to scapegoat the cops than to be honest about why they are interacting uh, in, with minority suspects more frequently. And, uh, it, you know, the, we would rather blame phantom racism for disparate outcomes than the fact that we do have a failure of socialization in the inner city, again, I'm not speaking about everybody, I'm speaking about averages. Uh, I am heartened by the number of blacks who embrace bourgeois values, the people who are you know, getting training in, in manual labor, which is the most important labor we've got that are respectful. You know, that happens. America is ready to be post-racial. Americans just want to get along, but we have a combined uh, you know, a, a rap culture, a popular culture 
that glamorizes dysfunction. And then you have an academic culture that teaches uh, privileged blacks who've been given entree to these universities to be resentful, to be hostile, to see of them, themselves as victims. And, uh, and, and you have that being egged on by the elites and it, it, it's holding off far longer than it should what really should be this country's racial reconciliation. Now, I'm not going to deny the fact that whites were absolutely brutal and callous and sadistic and cruel up through the 1960s, 1970s, not just in the South, but in the North. Uh, just a, a, a pathetic, outrageous violation of our finding, founding ideals. That was very real and conservatives tend to brush it under the rug. But today it is a very different world. And I I really do not know any white in any position of power who is not bending over backwards to, to create not just opportunities for blacks, but to give them an advanced leg up uh, compared to everybody else. We should stop that, stop blaming ourselves for funny racism and let Americans just get along because I think we're absolutely ready to be post-racial. Heather McDonald, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much, Larry. You got it. Larry Elder here, and I've got some great news for you. If you're tired of the censorship in this country, then you're in luck. You can go over to epictv.com and watch honest programs that don't spin the facts. epictv.com is a brand new, no censorship video platform where you can watch not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great program, wholesome movies that you can watch with your entire family. So head over to epictv.com. I'll see you there.